It's good to see everyone this morning. It's good to see many of you back. We had a sweet time of worship uh, two, just two days ago as we focused in on the, uh, the, the meaning and the weight of what Christ did on the cross on Friday. And we looked there in, in Luke's account of, uh, of Christ's time in Gethsemane. And I want us to go back, not to Gethsemane, but to Luke. So if you've got your Bibles, let me invite you. We're going to dive right in this morning. I invite you to go to Luke chapter 24, Luke 24. We're going to pick up in, in the Gospel of Luke on, on Resurrection Sunday. What has just taken place is, is the women have gotten up early. They've gone to the tomb to go uh, to, to, to treat the body, to continue to take care of the tomb since the Sabbath day interrupted, and they find the stone rolled away and the grave empty. And angels appear to them saying, why do you look for the living one among the dead? And Luke will record in, in chapter 24, verse 8, you can look with me. It says, and they, the women, they remembered Jesus' words. And they returned from the tomb and they reported these things to the eleven and to all the rest. So Sunday morning comes the ladies get up, they go to the tomb, and they find the tomb empty. The angels appear to them, telling them, Jesus isn't here, He's alive. Those ladies go back to where the disciples are gathered, and if you notice, it says the eleven and the rest. There's the eleven disciples, the twelve minus Judas, who's betrayed Jesus and has, has uh, taken His own life. But there's others who are there with them, and it's those others that lead to what in Luke's Gospel narrative will be the first appearance of Jesus post His resurrection. Look with me now at verse 13. And behold, two of them, two of who? Two of the rest. Two of them were going that day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with one another about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus Himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing, recognizing Him. And He said to them, what are these words you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. One of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem unaware of the things that have happened during these days? Or are you the only resident of Jerusalem who's clueless what's gone on? So here's the situation. Two, two, of, these, two of these disciples, they've heard the report that morning that the grave is empty and they, they are leaving. That would be normal. It's been Passover week. Everyone's come to Jerusalem and It'd be normal for, now that Passover has passed, it'd be normal for people to return to their villages. These two disciples are leaving Jerusalem to go to a small village, Emmaus, seven miles away. And as they're going, they're doing what all of us would do. They're talking, discussing, reflecting on all the events that have taken place because it has been a whirlwind week of dramatic consequence in Jerusalem. Here are these two disciples walk on the road on a Sunday, probably remembering how just one week prior they watched as the masses of Jerusalem waved palm branches, crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest as Jesus in fulfillment of Zechariah 9 came into the city on a donkey. They would watch the next day as during what would be one of the busiest times in the temple complex as Jesus entered in and would have created massive waves as He flips temples and cleanses the temple. As the next day goes, Jesus would have a massive clash with the religious leaders calling them whitewashed stones and people would follow, maybe even these disciples very likely, out of the temple complex across the Little Kidron Valley and up to the Mount of Olives where Jesus would be teaching about His second coming. Time would progress. Jesus would have the final supper with His disciples on 
the night before the crucifixion, everyone would awake. What we know as Good Friday, these disciples would awake that morning, the city stirring early, a buzz with news that Jesus had been arrested for treason, for blasphemy, that he, was, he, he, had been, he had been sentenced by the Sanhedrin, that he was being passed back and forth between Pilate and Herod and back to Pilate, that he had been beaten, that he was scourged, that, that he's now on his way through the city to be crucified where he was nailed and hung on a cross publicly for all to see. And by the way, in our depictions often, we see the crucifixion as Jesus and the other two men way up, way up high, on, away from everybody. The reality is they were right there on the main roadway. The Romans wanted everybody to see up close and personal what would happen to those who were criminals and traitors. Jesus died a very public, painful death. Jesus' was body was then taken and was, was laid to rest in a rich man's tomb, a known place. And these disciples have just heard the report that at that known tomb that was guarded by Roman soldiers, the soldiers were knocked out, angels had appeared, the body was gone. And just like we would do after a busy week of news, they are, they are discussing these things, trying to make sense of these things. And as they're talking, they are walking and talking, a stranger comes up to them and, and begins to walk with them, to join them in their travel. And as this stranger to them is listening, he says, what are you talking about? And you can imagine now their reaction. Are, are you the only person who doesn't have a clue? And Jesus said, well, tell me, tell me what, what happens. So they said, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty indeed in word and sight of God and all the people, how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that, that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all of this, it is the third day since these things happened. But, but some of the women among us also amazed us. When they were at the tomb early this morning, they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels saying Jesus was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Now here's what's fascinating, church family. Jesus walks up, it says their eyes were prevented from seeing Jesus. The language of that implies that, that God was actively keeping them from recognizing Jesus. Now, there, there's a theological reason for that. It's because ultimately salvation is by grace through faith. There, there's got to be faith in, in the Word of God, and we'll see that play out here in a moment when Jesus responds to them. But there's, there's another more, more practical, just simple realization. Realize these disciples not likely uh, of, of the, the, the 12 disciples that we tend to think of who would go to be the apostles, but these disciples had been close enough to Jesus that they should, they, they should recognize Him. These are not casual disciples who've observed Jesus far off. They, they have been close enough to Jesus that if, that if it wasn't for God preventing them from recognizing Him, they would recognize Him. And, and they, don't, they haven't just been up close and personal where they would recognize Jesus, but listen to all that they said. They, they, have, they have at least a minimal understanding. Jesus the Nazarene, the one from Nazareth, prophet. They recognize that there is something about Jesus that is, that is like the prophet greater than Moses to come. Mighty in power indeed that Jesus could do mighty things. Not only that, but mighty indeed in word in the sight of God. God's hand is on Jesus. They have some, some pretty accurate, minimal facts about Jesus. But notice that those facts, they're even aware, by the way, it says that they recounted how it's been three days since these things. Somewhere they, they, they have a memory that Jesus has said, three days later, I'll be crucified, and like Jonah, three days later, I will 
be resurrected. There is a basic minimal facts, but notice. When Jesus said, what are you talking about, it says, and remember, they're walking, it says they stopped and they were sad. It said our leaders delivered Him up to be that. Do you catch the irony? For all the time they may have spent with Jesus where they would be able to recognize His face because they've been close enough to Him, for all of the good biblical facts that they know, the irony is they are downcast and hopeless because they believe Jesus is dead when Jesus is alive standing right in front of them. So Jesus responds, look back with me, verse 25, and Jesus said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, Jesus explained to them all the things concerning Himself in all the Scriptures. Jesus responds to them. He said, O foolish, dull-witted men marked by no use of reason, you have knowledge, but you don't have any understanding. You have knowledge, but you're not reasoning correctly, slow of heart of heart, that place where the mind and will and one's thoughts and emotions and conscience all come together to produce our thoughts and action. He said, you, are, you lack reason, you lack understanding, you are slow of heart, and you refuse. And notice His rebuke. His rebuke is not, why don't you recognize me? I'm right here. His rebuke is not, why didn't you listen to the report of the empty tomb? Do you see what his rebuke is? Foolish men, slow of heart to believe, to faith, to rest the full weight of your being on that which is true, why are you slow of heart to faith in all the prophets have spoken? His rebuke is that they do not believe the very Word of God that they have read. The implication is if these disciples had really read and, and, and understood, interpreted correctly, and chose to believe what was written in the Old Testament, they would not be gloomy and downcast, but, but they would be worshiping at the feet of their risen Lord. The implication would be they wouldn't be walking back to Emmaus. They would have been waiting outside the tomb. But they did not trust the Word. And Jesus, Jesus calls them out. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things? At the core of their inability to believe is, is this problem. Like most of their day, they were awaiting a, a political, a, a a political Messiah who would redeem Israel, who would free them from the bondage of the Romans, who for the first time in centuries would restore to the nation of Israel, to, 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 to God's people in the Old Testament, would restore to them their kingdom. And the one that they thought would do it, Jesus, well, He's now dead, just like all the other prophets, because they did not understand Jesus is not in His first coming, a political Messiah coming to, to free them from an oppressive government. No, instead something greater is at work. Jesus says it was necessary. That word necessary means it must happen. It's unavoidably determined by divine choice. Well, why was it necessary for the Messiah to suffer? Well, Scripture gives us at least three simple reasons. One, because it was always God's plan. The book of Revelation will tell us Jesus is the Lamb slain for our sin before the foundation of the world. It means this, the plan of redemption, where Jesus, who has always been God, He's the second person of the triune God. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus, He's always been there. The Word was God, Jesus is God, always has been God, and the Word was with God, meaning Jesus as the second person of the Trinity. 
is co-equal, co-eternal, but unique and distinct as a person from the Father and the Spirit. The mystery of the Trinity, Jesus, whom Colossians tells us is the one through whom and by whom and for whom all of creation was made. Before Jesus ever spoke a word and brought creation into being, God who knows all things knew what we would do as humans given the choice. And before creation was ever even uttered, the plan of redemption, the decision of the God that Jesus would be the one who would come, who would take on human flesh, who would humble himself to the point of death, death on a cross to die as the sacrifice for our sin. It was already decided before creation was ever instigated. It's always been God's plan. The plan for Jesus to die on the cross was not plan B. It wasn't an alternative plan that God had to, had to have a, a little personal counsel and come up with once Adam and Eve sinned. It was always the plan. The lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Why was it necessary? Because it's God's plan. Why is it necessary? Because if Jesus doesn't go to the cross, then there is no sacrifice that can pay the price of our sin. And if there's no sacrifice to pay the price of our sin, if there's no bloodshed, there can be no forgiveness. There can be no redemption, buying us out of death, slavery to sin. And there can be no reconciliation where we are restored and brought back to a right, intimate, loving, knowing relationship with God. Scripture is clear. Without the shedding of blood, there's the no forgiveness of sin. Scripture is clear that the problem with the world is not which country or government is good or bad, which employer is, is good or bad. The problem with the world is all comes back to the problem of humanity, which is our brokenness in sin. We are born by nature sinners, broken, made in the image of God fearfully and wonderfully, but broken from that relationship with God. Because of the sin in our nature, we do actions of sin, and it's those unrighteous, those actions that fall short of God, of His character, of His glory, those actions which we say, well, Lord, I want to stand before you and give account. Well, great. Everyone will get to do it. And if you stand in your own actions, those actions can never, no matter how good, no matter how bad, those actions can never make one right with God. That is the plight of humanity. Jesus must suffer to deal with the issue of our sin because Jesus, in taking on humanity, lived the life we fail to live. He died the death on the cross. We looked at this Friday night. We're on the cross. It's not just this horrific physical death. On the cross, He drinks the eternal justice of God poured out on sin. We, we would use the term hell. He drank the punishment I rightfully deserve in full. Paid the price. It's necessary for our salvation. It's necessary. He says, look, look back with me. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into glory? The glory of Jesus, not as God, but as, as Messiah, the glory of, of Jesus being the Messiah for all who would believe is, is tied to His having suffered. Philippians tells us it was He who humbled Himself to the point of death, and God has exalted Him. He said, if you really paid attention, you would understand it is necessary that the Messiah suffer. But the disciples, like many, miss this because of the offense of the cross. Paul will tell the, the Corinthian church, he says, listen, the cross of Jesus, the Messiah crucified, it is a stumbling block to the Jews, to those who think they can earn their way to God by going to church, by doing good deeds, by giving of their money, by being born in, in a religious family, whatever way you think you can earn your way to God. For those who think you can earn your way to God, it's a stumbling block because the cross says you can't. It's foolishness to the Greeks 
to those who are built on ph- philosophy and, and, see, and see Jesus as a Messiah, as a political figure or a social figure or just a good moral example. It's foolishness. You don't win by dying, you win by conquering. That's man's brokenness speaking. He says, the cross of Christ, it's a stumbling block to the Jews. It's foolishness to the Greeks. It's why it's an offense to all unless you are being saved. They overlook it. And then then he goes on. He says, was it not necessary? And to help them understand, it says that he, he beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained a a word that means he he interpreted, he makes sense of, he gave meaning to, he, he takes them all the way back. And on the rest of their walk, he walks them through the Old Testament. And as he walks them through the Old Testament, he shows them how Jesus fulfilled every one of the prophecies the Old Testament points to, including those of his suffering. He he explains all of it. Oh, church family, don't miss this today. Jesus is the bread of life which comes down from heaven greater than the manna Israel had in the wilderness. Jesus is the good shepherd who lays his life down for his sheep, unlike the faithless shepherds who led Israel into ruin. Jesus is Isaiah's Emmanuel, God with us, born of a virgin. He is Zechariah's rider on the donkey. He is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. He is the root of Jesse and the son of David. He is the son of man riding on the cloud from Daniel 7. He is the sacrifice greater than Isaac. He is the prophet greater than Moses and Elijah, the king greater than David. He is the fulfillment of all the law and the sacrifices and the festivals. He is the righteous sufferer of Psalm 22. He is the light of among the Gentiles of Galilee in Isaiah 9. He is the new Adam who succeeds where the old Adam failed. He is the Passover lamb of Exodus. He is the rock which produces living water. He is the one who is high and lifted up. He is the one greater than Jonah. He is the seed of the woman who crushes the head of the serpent. He is Jesus. And he fulfills all of the law and the prophets. He said he didn't come to abolish it, but to fulfill it all. By conservative estimation, by the way, by conservative estimation, Jesus fulfills over 300 Old Testament prophecies in his first coming. Jesus says, this is who I am. And understand, church family, what, what Luke writes here today is clear. Jesus, Luke wants us to be clear. He wanted his original readers to be clear. He wants us to be clear. Jesus is, in fact, the risen Messiah. Jesus is God's anointed Savior for all who believe. He is the fulfiller of all prophecy for whom it was necessary to suffer the cross on our behalf. And in humbling himself to the point of death, God grants to him the name above all names, at the sound of which all knees will bow and all tongues will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. This is the point. We're to know it with certainty. Luke's whole point in the gospel is to provide a painstakingly accurate picture of the life of Christ. Church family, Jesus' resurrection is not a myth or a fairy tale. It is not a holiday that we remember one day of the year. It is a historical reality fulfilling all prophecy beforehand and altering all human destiny afterward. The resurrection means God's love can actually be known and experienced as a human. It means reconciliation with God and and it's possible and eternal life is real. It means we have hope and there is a reason for eternal glory because salvation is here to the one who would believe. By the way, did you catch? Luke made it really clear there were two witnesses. He gives us one of their names. He doesn't tell us the other. Maybe it was a buddy. Maybe it was Cleopas' wife. But who they are is irrelevant. It's important that the first picture of Luke's resurrection to two witnesses Because in the Old Testament, two witnesses were required for legal authority and testimony. Jesus is the Messiah. He is risen. And the question before us today is real simple. How do we respond? 
We've got to respond rightly to the reality of the resurrection. We respond to the real Jesus. Today, we must respond to the real Jesus against false promotions. There are churches throughout our country, or there are groups of people with the name church on a billboard all throughout our country today that will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, but not all will celebrate the actual Jesus who rose. Some will celebrate Jesus as a great moral example of how we should love each other. Certainly, Jesus provided an example, but His crucifixion and resurrection is much bigger than that. Some will celebrate a Jesus who, uh, longing for a political Messiah, a revolutionary who will overthrow everything. Some long and will, and will teach and celebrate a Jesus today who is like a kind old grandpa giving health, wealth, and prosperity. Some will celebrate a Jesus that they believe to have not always been God, but to be a man that was created that achieved God. Listen, there's a lot of different places that what you and I have to do today, church family, is respond to the real Jesus, the one who is, the one who is eternally and fully God, the second person of the Trinity, the one who took on full humanity, who came, who lived, who died, who rose, who ascended, who reigns, and is returning. We respond to the real Jesus against false promotions. Not all interpretations of Scripture are equally valid. These men had an interpretation, and their interpretation left them in despair. They didn't realize the real Jesus in front of them. We've got to respond to the real Jesus against false expectations. Here's the greatest thing that stands out to me in this passage, church family. These disciples aren't clueless. They know some actual tangible facts. They know some things, which tells me that you and I can know about Jesus but not actually know Jesus. Knowledge does not produce faith and hope. Knowledge apart from actually trusting who Jesus is at what He says about who He is and what He does, that is where salvation and knowing Jesus is found. Jesus did not come to live, die, rise, to just set a good example. He's not Superman, right? If you remember the Superman movie, Superman's father says, you will give humanity an ideal to strive for. Jesus is not an ideal to strive for because none of our striving can meet His ideal. Jesus did not come to make this world a nice, comfy place. He is the light of the world that the world rejected. He's the one who reveals our value and purpose made in the image of God. He exposes the deadness of our rebellion. We've all sinned and fallen short. He suffered the weight of our sin. He became our sin that He might reconcile us to a right relationship with God, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He is the suffering servant and the eternal King, and we must accept Him as He really is. Because He suffered, we will suffer, those of us in Christ. But because He rose, we will rise, those of us in Christ. Because He ascended into glory, we will go home to glory because we are in Christ. We can take heart because He has overcome the world, but it, we, we can only know His peace if we respond to who He really is and not who our expectations might think He is. Pastor. How do I know who He really is? His Word. His Word. If we're going to respond rightly to who He is, it means we got to respond to Him in real faith at His Word. What did He get on to these disciples for? He said, you don't really pay attention to My Word. You know some about it. You can rattle off some verses. They know enough Old Testament that they can engage in a conversation with Jesus all the way through the Old Testament and realize they don't have a phone with a Bible app. Doing it all from memory. The question is not, do we know what the Word says? Do we actually trust what the Word says? Do we submit and trust that when the Word says that of everything in all of creation, you and I as humans are more valuable than anything in all creation? You and I alone are made in the image of God. Do we trust what the Word says that God delighted? God, it was a joy for God to create. He made delighted to do it. 
Do we trust what the Word says, that we have fallen short because we chose sin and rebellion? Do we trust what the Word says, that God so loved He sent the one and only unique Son, Jesus Christ, second person of the Trinity, to take on flesh? That in this God's love is made clear, not that we love God. We didn't ask God for salvation. God desired to seek and save His image bearers. And that for any person who would, who would respond to the reality of this truth by going, wow, I'm in the wrong. I, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm thick in the death of sin. I don't know my value. I don't have an identity. I, I, just, I just know the turmoil of, of sin and lostness. And God, you're right. On the basis of your word, I'm going to turn to you, repentant. And I am trusting that Jesus There is nothing I can ever do to make me right, but because of who you are and what you've done, I am seating the whole weight of my person for eternity. My whole hope is sitting on who you are and what you've done. I need you to be my Savior so I can know you as Lord. For by grace through faith, one is saved. God's saving grace enters through true faith. When you've been saved... God's sufficient grace is experienced through living faith. We don't move away from faith. We continue to walk in Jesus. How? By grace through faith. To trust, to rest upon His Word. And here's what's incredible. Jesus offers Himself to any and all who would come. Do you realize in Luke's Gospel, the first appearance of the resurrected Jesus is essentially to two unnamed disciples? And go, well, we get one named Cleopas. That's great, Cleopas. We know nothing about him other than that. Jesus desires to seek and save the humble, hungry heart who would respond. And when you and I respond rightly to Jesus in real faith, here's what it produces. Look with me as we come to the end. They approached the village, and he acted as though he were going to go further. They urged him, saying, stay with us. It's getting late. The day is almost over. So Jesus went in and stayed with them. When he reclined at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they got up at that very hour, they returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, the Lord is really risen. The resurrection is real. He appeared to Simon, to Peter. And they began to relate their experience on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of bread. See, here's the reality, church family. When you and I respond to the real Jesus in real faith, when you and I, whether that is to be saved or whether you've been saved by grace through faith and it's a matter of us returning and making sure we walk with Jesus for who He is, trusting Him daily and not who we might fear He is sometimes, or, but who He is. Here's what it produces. It produces a burning, loving, living, joy-filled, hopeful heart. Their eyes are open where our hearts were burning within us there's, do you catch what it says? Hey, Jesus, don't, don't go further. We're seven miles away from Jerusalem. The sun is almost set. Stay with us. And, 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 and the response to the real resurrected Jesus is, brings such excitement, such joy, such fervor. The disciples don't go, oh, wow, well, you know what? That's a seven-mile walk. It's going to take us Uh, If we walk four miles per hour, it's going to take us an hour and a half to get there. There's no street lights. These are dangerous roads. We'll just wait till tomorrow. Let's sleep on it. It says they got up that instant and they ran. And they ran straight to where the disciples were gathered, and it was a joyous celebration. They, They didn't isolate. They ran to the community of the other believers. They ran in fading light, church, family. I'm not foolhardy to think most of us who show up to church on Easter Sunday, we can check the box that we know the facts, Jesus is resurrected. The question is, is it just knowledge or is it understanding? Is it just something we know about Jesus or do we know Jesus personally? And if we know Jesus personally, 
Is the reality of the resurrection just a one Sunday of the year Christian holiday? Or is the resurrection a reality that produces daily, as I walk with Christ in faith, a joy, a passion, a hope, a fervor that draws me in to the bride, that keeps me in uh, meeting with the church of God as we worship Him? Does it produce a worship of the burning heart? Does our living reveal His love? Is it marked by real hope? Is it saturated in His joy? Is our, are our lives just proclaiming the worthiness of His worship? Because if we really understand He is risen, He and risen indeed is not just a saying, Jesus is risen fat. He is the fulfillment of all God promised in the Old Testament, fat. He will really save by grace that enters through faith, fact. And if we've been saved, His grace is really sufficient for our life as we walk with Him, trusting Him at His Word, fact. And if those things are really true and in our heart, then are we overflowing with the joy and hope of the resurrected Lord? May it be. Let's pray. Jesus, we look to you. What a joy. Lord, we're, we, we pray to you. We, we have sung songs of worship to you, and Jesus, we're not doing that in memorial, but, but you are there at the right hand of the Father. You, you, are, you are reigning on high, and you hear. You are present amongst us. You see. You, you speak. You move because you are alive. And Father, very simply in this time of invitation, if there's any that don't know you and now would be the time where, Spirit, you have pierced their heart and their heart is burning, may they turn to you. For any of us, Lord, that you have saved by grace through faith, if there is conviction in our heart, may we respond, may we confess. If there is discouragement in our heart, may we heed your words of encouragement, Lord. May we be children of the burning heart because we have encountered and we know you, Jesus, the real resurrected Messiah. Jesus, we look to you. It's in your name I pray. Amen.